Well, g'day, Hey, going? Phil Tarrant, co-host of Inside Commercial Property with Rethink Investing. It's just not me talking on this podcast around commercial property. There's a guy by the name of Scott O'Neill. You might have heard of him beforehand. Uh, founder, managing director, CEO, uh, Rethink Investing. One of the most in-demand people in commercial property in Australia. Uh, back for 2023. Pumped about the year ahead. And we had a really good discussion late 2022 about what the future holds. Well, this is the future right now. We're in 2023 right now. Uh, people are holding on, they're strapped in, wondering what's gonna happen with property markets, commercial property markets moving forward, intrinsically connected with the health of the Australian economy. What's gonna happen for Australia this year? What's the security environment like? What's the inflationary environment like? What's the rate environment like? Who knows, but guess what? We're gonna be chatting about it through the lens of commercial property and how you can capitalize on this great asset class irrespective of market conditions. Scott O'Neill, how are you going? You well? Very good, Phil. Happy New Year, mate. It's good to be back. And yeah, thanks for the intro. And I'm excited for this year. I think it's going to be uh, probably one of the most interesting years we'll, uh, I've seen in my investing career. There's, you know, talk of the uh, interest rates going to rise a bit more and what number that's going to finish at. Uh, that'll have a big impact on asset valuations, of course, if it goes higher. Values might come down further, but if it doesn't peak as high as people think or for as long as people think, then we might be uh, entering the next phase of the property cycle a bit sooner than we think. So I'm excited. I think, um, yeah, regardless of, of what you're doing, it, it's definitely a market you need to pay attention to because it's not one that's going to be just sitting around doing nothing. That's for sure. No, so absolutely. And I, I, I don't know. I don't know, mate. It's um, uh, You saw over the, the break, a lot of people, a lot of economic commentators are now saying, maybe it's not going to be any more rate rises in 2023. Everyone's sitting around waiting for the first, Tuesday in February to see what the Reserve Bank of Australia does. Maybe we can touch on, on that today uh, with our guests. But um, uh, because I view Australian property through a global lens of what's happening around the world, I'm, I'm currently in New Zealand. Uh, Scott, um, I've been nosing around some property markets here. I'm in Auckland, uh, parts of Auckland. Uh, they went through some structural changes um, uh, last year and, and a little bit early on around whether or not you could um, deduct uh, uh, mortgage repayments uh, as, a, as a property investor. They, they got rid of that. That had an impact on property markets here. Their rates started going up a lot earlier than, than what it did in Australia. Yeah, that's had an impact uh, here. I'm in a you know, sort, of, uh, sort of nicer area of, of, of Auckland and um, uh, prices are down 20, 25% uh, from their peaks, whether or not we'll see that in Australia, how far it will go, but we're in that process right now. Uh, that's from a resident point of view the commercial market out here is again different like it is in Australia uh, and we always like discussions around uh, evolving investors mindset to think outside of residential property and, and commercial property uh, is where uh, many are sort of plugging their money right now which is a bit of mainstay of discussions in this particular podcast but Scott we like feedback um, we're big boys and we can take feedback if it's not that uh, favorable um, most of it pointed to me rather than you they, they seem to like you um, so maybe, I don't know, you're going to replace me on this podcast at some point in time for, for someone a bit um, more, more likable and capable. But um, uh, we get a lot of feedback. But one of the uh, enduring themes over 2022, Scott, was we want more guests. Okay, we're working on that. We've listened. Uh, and the guests, the most in-demand guests that people want is an accountant. So you've asked yeah, everyone and we've delivered. We've got the counter to property investment stars joining us today, mate. Yeah, that's right. We've uh, for about six months, I reckon uh, I've been asked oh, over a hundred times get an accountant on because we've got this podcast that's been running for over two years, and uh, it's quite a complex asset class. And people want to know what structures to buy, what what the implications are with tax, and yeah, it's, it's uh, sometimes it can be sort of the the forgotten topic, but it's probably one of the most important ones before you even get started. So, you know, probably should have got uh, an accountant on one of the first episodes, but Two years later, here we are, and yeah, I'm I'm excited for this one, and yeah, it's uh, obviously your long term account, Munsrill, and we uh, we've got lots and lots of shared clients together now. So yeah, it's um, I think I think his experience is yeah, second to none in the space. So yeah, it'd be re very interesting. Oh, mate, I completely agree, and I've got to be careful with this because I try and protect my accountant because um, as long as he does my stuff first, over everyone else's, I'm quite happy, but. <laughs> 
the biggest issue, the biggest issue we have is that whenever he appears on a podcast, he gets immensely busy and um uh and no, he does he always he always thinks about me. But Munzrul Khan um uh from KHI Partners uh has been my long-term uh, accountant for for sort of private wealth type stuff, um trusted part of my uh team to to help me sort of grow and and, and create wealth uh through through property and other asset classes and uh exceptional accountant from a uh, a tactical point of view from, uh, you know, the compliance and the rigor around it um, as a as a, a property investor and someone that owns businesses, but they're more so um, strategically orientated. And you don't normally get that with, with accountants. They're more sort of sometimes process orientated. So strategically orientated with a strategic outcome holds me accountable for, for, for where I'm trying to to go. So I'm happy to happy to share him with, with everyone on this podcast today. And uh, I do know, uh, Scott, that a lot of your clients have started to use Munzerall as well. So, Munzerall, welcome to the show. We're talking about commercial property rather than residential. You're going to be okay about that. Yes, right. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. Thank you for inviting and and it's 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 been such a privilege of of being in here. I was, I was listening to some of your comments, uh, uh, Scott, and and your comments as well, Phil. And and probably one thing which comes in my mind first is this this invisible hand the invisible hand as we say in the world of economics that everything gets balanced out over a period of time right so and we as an investor where we stay as a long-term investor is that it's the anomalies of the market which in my mind provides the best of the opportunities and i think that's what the 2023 is while there is a bit of sense of doom and gloom that we ended the last year, and this year seems to be a little bit of doom and gloom, but you know what, things will change. And you're right, uh, uh, Phil, that in terms of the interest rate side of it, is that if you were to ask me in December, I would have put my hands up and say 0.25 in, in February and 0.25 in March, probably quite given, right? But now you sort of look back uh, over the Christmas and you look into the some of the inflation, you look into how US and US sort of taking a little bit of a step back and Australia arguably follows the US, right? And and you sort of say, oh, maybe we're sort of getting almost at the, uh, that sort of the peak of that sort of the market as such, right? Uh, and, and that's where it is. It's, it's the animal is in the market and how the investors take the full benefit out of it. Yeah, so lots for us to cover uh, today, Manjul, and, and some of them want to sort of get into maybe some of the technicalities of of um, uh, appropriate and effective accounting uh, through the lens of commercial property, but also like to chat a little bit strategically as well. We've got a whole bunch of uh, recent questions, and, and we'll get we'll get into them as we we navigate this particular discussion where it becomes relevant that it's the right time to talk about that, and, and many of them around sort of structural stuff and. Um, the mechanics of tax, uh, which I must admit, I don't get that excited about. Um, but I like talking about it because it helps me frame strategic of what, what I should be doing as a, an investor in both residential and commercial property. But, but Manjul, we've got to start at the top, mate. Um, uh, you, you, you're, you're, you're yourself um, uh, a sophisticated investor. I'll, 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 I can easily call you that. Um, you have a, a large property portfolio that includes both uh, resi and, and commercial assets. Um, you diversified personally also in, in business assets and, and other asset classes. But um, why commercial property, Munzerl? Do you still get excited about commercial property? Uh, and I know you, you support a lot of Scott's clients in, in relation to this. Um, why commercial over resi uh, for you at this uh, moment, at this juncture? Uh, look, I mean, the commercial property has got a whole lot of benefits, right? So there's many benefits, and and I might just outline some of them, and the Scott sort of uh, can sort of add, is is the commercial property is that uh, it's all about the numbers, right? So you look through the actual return, and and the return oriented it is, it's the cash flow, and and the beauty of that cash flow with the commercial property is that very often there are exceptions, but very often that you uh, receive a net return. So say as an example, the investor is receiving about 6, 6.25, 6.5% 6 return. Uh, it's, it's sort of arguably is much better of, of equivalent of say 6, 6.2 or 6.5 of residential because this 6% coming in as a net. So this is where you have the, uh, the tenant who sort of pays with the right level of lease and negotiation and terms. Tenant sort of pays all the bills. So all the bills, the utility bills and everything else, you know, it goes all the way to even land tax. 
So in most cases, the tenant sort of also pays the land tax as well. So your return is a true net return. The only exp expense that one may argue that it, uh, the investor may need to pay, which would be the real estate or the agent's commission, which is relatively pre-nominal, right? So what you have as a top line is what you have as a bottom line. So that helps. That's number one. Number two, uh, commercial property is very often as a long-term lease. So rather than having sort of a periodic lease or whether you have a six month sort of a lease, uh, you've got a long term lease, right? And that uh, uh, whether it's two years, whether it's three years and very option, there are um, options in terms of renewing that lease. And also there is a clause in terms of the market uh, valuation of that sort of the option side of it, right? So it's it's those uncertainty, uh, those certainties of the return is the one which sort of attracts. Now, a myth that feel that I hear very often is that with the residential property, we take a lot of pride saying that, well, you've got your natural growth, you also have your manufacturing growth. So the growth that you can sort of almost generate, right? So residential is all about the growth, right? Because the return isn't there. Now, I may argue that with the right level of commercial property, that one can also generate that, that manufacturing growth, right? Mm -hmm. Your typical example of the mezzanine floor, it's sort of almost just, just extending your floor space if it can be done. And, and the rents are very often on the basis of the floor space as such, right? So all of those are attraction. The other attraction, I suppose, with the commercial property as well as myth sometimes is that the investors sort of say, well, the interest rate is a bit high in the commercial property uh, and, and is it still sort of the similar level of return? Uh, but many of the banks are becoming very, very competitive, right? Not only uh, the interest rate, also with the LVR, the loan to valuation ratio, right? So gone are the days that uh, one used to get only about 65% of the LVR, right? So my first commercial property I bought probably oh, from memory about 12 years ago, 14 years ago, right? And it was 65%, maybe 70% was like, we would say, wow, that's pretty good. But now there are banks which goes all the way up to 80%, right? Uh, so that's an attraction. And the second part of that attraction is, is that with the right level of income in a commercial property, one can also potentially consider a concept called lease stock loan. And the lease stock loan, what it does is that it takes away all the rest of the complexity that you have. And, and the bank sort of purely just looks at one entity. So let's say as an example that you've got a family, new family trust that you're sort of purchasing a commercial property and you've got a whole lot of other business and everything else and so forth. Or want to do a, say, $1.5 million loan or want to bring in all of those different entities, it's a lot of work, right? But with the right level of rent, and, and if the rent is sort of sustaining, the bank can just purely look into that one trust and say that we'll just set aside all the rest of it. So there's, there's definitely quite a bit of benefit, um, Phil. So uh, lots here. It's, um, uh, we, we've got probably 52 weeks of, of uh, podcast discussions just on, on that manager. Um, uh, but I'll take the point. Um, uh, commercial property does have its benefits over uh, resi and and resi has its benefits over sure. commercial property for, for you Manjul, and and a, a big sort of discussion my, my myself and and scott have and, and and you know scott's view is you know resi is a great place to start investing in property but it's probably not where you want to finish investing in property so there is a point in time when most property investors reach this inflection point where they go yeah i'm getting good capital growth but my yields ain't great on resident property. I need to start thinking about strategically why I'm doing this. And for most people, it's to be replacing income for retirement. Um, when, when did you make the shift personally in, into commercial over resi? Because I know you've got a, a large uh, resi portfolio, Mandra. Do you still dabble in both? How do you balance them? I, I do, Mike. I do. And, and, and you know what? What you actually said is, is so true, right? Very often we start with the residential property because the see, commercial property, uh, there's a sense of complexity behind it, right? And complex, it doesn't mean it's incorrect. Complex means that we just need to go a little bit deeper and understand a bit more and just have a bit more analytic behind it, right? And a bit more statistics, a bit more system process and mitigation and all the rest of it. But sometimes residential properties is that whether it is easier to start with, right? 
right? Because the great Australian dream that all of our parents probably had the uh, property as well. And we've seen it as sort of building and developing and growing as such. It's next door and we sort of buy it. So many of my investors and including me, if I look back, is that I started with residential, right? And, and, and I started with residential when the knowledge sort of builds and develops and grows over a period of time, you go into the commercial. So for the first about uh, five to six years of my investment journey, all my properties were residential. And then I started with the commercial property. So uh, I've got a whole bunch of commercial properties in, uh, in New South Wales. I've also got commercial property in Melbourne as well. Uh, and, and yes, as it is, might is that any asset class, you've got a certain element of risk. And, and the investment in the longer period of time is mitigating that risk and to know what are the strengths and to work through. And the other comment which I'll say is that I'm being blessed over the years of seeing very, 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 I suppose, wealthy family in the longer period of time and, and sort of large family and sort of sophisticated investors. And if I look back into that sort of the end, I sort of see that not many of them actually have a whole bunch of residential properties, right? And I must say, and they sort of say that it's just that day-to-day -day maintenance of the residential property. Initially, while it is exciting, over a period of time, when it becomes a bit torturous. I completely agree, mate. You hear me complaining about it all the time. It's such a first world problem whinging about how hard it is to maintain a residential uh, property portfolio. But, but I, 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 I tend to view uh, investing through the same lens as, as both of you um, as a point in time to transition uh, into only commercial or as, as, as uh, to augment your resi property in, into commercial. And I guess that sort of takes us to this, this, this first question, Munzrel, and thanks for your own shared, uh, sharing your own personal experience. But when do you actually, the question is, and there's a number of these questions has come, come through, so I'll, I'll just sort of curate them together. When do you know it's time to switch from resi into commercial? Yeah, good, good question. And probably it's a very difficult question, right? And, and probably it's a very difficult question is that one sort of argues that there is no one answer to it, right? So the way I probably would sort of do uh, this is that I'll sort of say it all goes back to your individual goals and objectives. What do you wish to do? So uh, it's about doing that sort of a self-analytic is to say that, well, I as, let's say I'm John Joe as an example. So I as John is that where is my financial circumstances right at this stage? And what are my goals? What are my retirement goals? You know, what are my smart goals over a period of time? So to know that this is where I am, this is where I wish to do, go over a period of time. That's where we sort of say that, well, what's the gap and what's the requirement? And how does the commercial property comes in as part of the gap and, and, and the retirement. So to give you as an example is that I've got a Dr. Klein as an example that uh, beautiful, she's many years, many years that uh, this Dr. Klein bought a whole bunch of residential properties, did very well and so, uh, but reached at a level that uh, the occup occupation sort of demands quite a bit of a time and day-to-day -day management of the residential property, perhaps is sort of the time is not there anymore. And the Dr. Klein moved into the commercial property and looking back saying that, well, why didn't I do it number of years earlier right so no one answer it all goes back to your individual goals but what i've seen is that one to start with the residential property after about two or three years commercial sort of becomes uh, very strong i'd like to add just on just onto that as well you a big question yeah. sorry go yeah. ahead mate um yeah so i'd like to to add to bundle's comments because um it's a question that comes up a lot with my clients and I like to sort of try get it before they run out of serviceability because this is the problem where many of my clients have got a large uh, residential portfolio. They've exhausted their lending through their uh, pay-as-you-go job and, and there's almost no way to get the equity out unless you start selling down or they get a pay rise. And uh, admittedly, this is kind of the, the situation I got in when I first sort of ran out of gas and it, it meant I had to sort of sit on the sidelines for a few years while I... Um, basically sold off a couple and found income elsewhere. And um, yeah, look, lease stock loans were the solution in the initial days in the commercial field. And that was the big game changer for myself and hundreds of my other clients as well. Because a lease stock loan is, it's a new uh, form of serviceability, which is from the lease itself. So it doesn't require you to, uh, to, to basically, um, yeah, support the loan. And we've mentioned this multiple times on the podcast, but 
it's good to sort of plan with your mortgage broker and your and your accountant hopefully years in advance before you run into the serviceability wall because even if you've got equity in a residential portfolio you can't necessarily pull it out and then use it for a commercial purchase even if the commercial property is a 10 percent yielding asset if it's stuck in that portfolio it's stuck so uh, you've got to plan just like you would with a business years in advance, hopefully. Uh, and your mortgage broker is your best person to answer this. And hopefully they've got commercial and residential experience because um, otherwise they won't know the answers. Uh, but that's, you know, you, you should know through the serviceability calculation when the time is right. That's how I think um, the situation is. And, and just knowing what that impact, the extra cash flow from commercial properties would be. Because remember, um, like it was good Muntral brought up the gross return versus net return. The average yielding property that an investor might get in residential could be 4% gross, 5% gross. Once you take the outgoings out, you're down at 1% or 2% net. So if your commercial property is 6% net, you're, you're, you're more than triple the cash flow. So obviously that's going to help with serviceability if you can acquire commercial properties earlier in your portfolio. So maybe it's not a question of just going all in commercial or all in resi. Maybe it's a bit of both as you go. That's, there could be a few different answers like that. Yeah. So one of the, so the catalyst then for, for working out where, when it's time or when it will be time to move into commercial is where you start thinking one, one view is through your serviceability um, uh, for resi property and when that's going to expire. So least stock loans, uh, Scott, they, they sound too good to be true. Um, is this essentially, if you find a good asset uh, that's stable with good cash flow, if you can stump up the deposit, largely the banks are happy to secure it against that single asset without taking into, into account any of your other um, uh, debt requirements or debt debt positioning. Yeah, that's, that's correct. So a lot of my clients who are over the age of 60 and they're retired, because I've, I've got a lot of clients that have fully retired, so they've got no income except for maybe some you know, share di dividends and other rental incomes, that type of stuff. But uh, you generally work off the equation, the banks will lend on the lease on the property. So let's say you've got a five year lease term, they'll give you a four year because it's one year minus the lease term is the loan term they'll offer. So it's a shorter loan term, that's the negative. But uh, if you run out, the bank's not going to call your loan in. This is, this is one of those myths that a lot of people will fear that, oh, it's only a four year loan term. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to have to pay all my debt back instantly. And I actually ran into this situation personally because uh, I had a one-year loan term. It was the only way I could get my first commercial property over the line. And the tenant didn't renew. Um, so I was going on a month-to-month -month lease. And this I was with Commonwealth Bank at the time. And the only thing that changed was they bumped my interest rate about half a percent until I renewed the lease. So I was penalised for having no lease in place. But... They won't get to call my loan and tell me to pay X amount of dollars back by this month. That would not help the bank. That would mean I'd have to sell the asset. They would lose the business. So they'll work with you in these situations and every case is different. But, uh, you know, you might buy a multi-tenant investment, which has got a whole bunch of leases uh, expiring and starting at different periods. So, you know, your, your lease term will always sort of move with your leases, uh, sorry, your, uh, your interest uh, and your loan terms. But... Um, it's a very popular strategy. It's one that, uh, yeah, I'd, I'd say one in three of my clients use. So it's extremely common. And, um, you know, most people end up sort of staying with it uh, for as long as they need to. And then they'll switch onto a full doc loan if they can as well, because your, your interest rate might be half a percent lower or there, there is mm -hmm. benefits to go full doc if you can. Yeah. So, so on that basis, a question for you, Mundral, if, if you have the serviceability to go full doc on a commercial property should you should you do that um it's an accounts question should should you do that rather than going into a lease stock which sounds as though there's probably less it's easy to get there's less friction um but there is downsides because of the shorter loan term what what, what would be your recommendation there yeah, like, uh, good question because there's a couple of points which i was going to say uh on, on sort of those as scott's comment everything which is scott says i agree with all of those right a standard thing which I've seen with some of my sophisticated investors, what they do is that as much as it is within practicality is not to have all the lease being ending at one period of time, mm. 
And sometimes we've been bound with the practicality we understand, right? So if something sort of ends, uh, say, in two years' time, something ends three years' time, something ends at a four years' time, that sort of gives you a natural level of protection. So that's one of the things which I've seen. The second thing which I've seen is that sometimes what the banks sort of do is that, say, when the bank sort of lends out a certain amount of sort of fund in the open world is that uh, they don't really wish to bring that fund back in within the business. The banks are there in terms of the lending side of it, right? So it's almost their vested interest is to say, how do we make it work? And sometimes what I've seen is that for them to make it work is that all they do is to say that, well, you initially borrowed 80%, we will just go back and reduce it to 70%. And your valuation of that property may have already increased quite a bit by then. So you do a new valuation, goes back to 70%, your original loan may stay still the same, and, and, and the whole thing sort of restart again. So there are many different ways that one can sort of structure and one can sort of organize, right? Now, saying all of those, Phil, your, your question is right, that there is a still an element of risk, right? And there's still an element of risk that if all sort of falls apart, then do we get into a position where it sort of becomes a bit harder? One may counter argue this, saying that list of loan, which, which um, Scott, as you were sort of saying, is that with the list of loan that the serviceability is being done over a short period of time, three years or five years, but where they do with three years and five years, because it is interest only, and the, the serviceability calculation is being done. I'm not a mortgage broker. This is my secondhand knowledge. So any mortgage broker listening and saying that Mantra, you haven't got it totally right. So please, I do excuse. But what I hear from the mortgage broker is that with that three years or five years of serviceability, because the serviceability is being done on the interest only and also a short period of time, you actually service a lot more as opposed to a longer loan where one bank bank still sort of looks into the PI, even with the fact that you may be three or five years as interest only. So there is a whole lot of benefit attached to it, right? But Phil, this there's also an element of risk, right? So I suppose the question comes in is that should they be doing it all in full dog? Should they be doing it all in list dog? Should it be a combination? I think my view is that it's not really a black and white in one side or the other side, saying that everything we should be doing at a full dog. Ideally we should. But depending on the investor circumstances, you may actively do a combination of it. So Scott, as an example, an investor could be at a growth phase, right? And because I'm at a growth phase, that I want to protect my serviceability. And while I sort of protect my serviceability, what that means is that I've got a plan based on my smart goals that I want to buy this second and third and fourth property. So yes, I know that I qualify for the uh, uh, the full doc on that example, but for me qualifying for the full doc, let's say argument's sake that I get about two mil, but if I go into the lease doc, I get a little bit higher. You may wish to make an active decision in an informed manner where you mix and match a bit, Scott. Yeah, and that, that's right. And something I like to, to work with my clients on the planning side of things is depending on your debt level, you have different levels of uh, debt ratio. So if you're at, at the starting point, this is why most people start in residential, you might go at a 90% LVR, you know, just get in the market. Then you might start getting over a million dollars debt. Maybe it's smarter to be at 80%. If you start getting over three or four or five million, maybe start getting under the 70% or a 65% debt level. And obviously the, the investors who get into the tens of millions, you probably want to get more around the 50% debt level over your portfolio because you know the banks aren't going to see you as a, a great risk because your leverage is, is quite healthy depending on your level. And uh, obviously your income and your interest rate cover is going to be better as well. So that's something I've been uh, sort of working at as I went with my own portfolio. Like, you know, you just don't feel comfortable with a certain ratio of debt when you've got an extra zero on the back of it, you know, you've got to, you've got to basically play for that worst case scenario and, uh, and managing your debt levels is on a ratio basis is probably the, I think the smartest way of doing it. And that will keep your mortgage broker happy naturally. And, and, so, and the timing of the investor that they are, right? So the answer to that question of the least dog and the full dog, as an example, someone who's sort of, let's say, mid 50s or late 50s, as opposed to, say, someone who's sort of, say, mid 30s or sort of the early 40s, uh, arguably that will also depend as well, right? And it would vary. Someone who's sort of, say, early 40s may say that I'm at a growth phase in terms of my investment side of it. So while I do understand the risk is that I've got a few other things on the side of it as my buffer and I'm sort of actively taking a bit more. Someone who's sort of more towards mid 
50s and late 50s may say that, well, I'm getting more close to that retirement. So if I'm sort of 58 and I've got a five years of sort of release doc, and once I go into that 60, does that quite significantly decreases my, uh, I suppose, the ability to go into a full doc. So is full doc a better on that circumstances? So I think there is a time and place feel for both. And it all sort of depending on, uh, I suppose, where we are as an investor. Yeah, and, and connected yes, to that. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Phil. I, I know we'll edit this out, but I, I, I saw you cut out, so I didn't know if you were there or not. So all good. I'm, I'm, I'm back. Um, uh, so, Mandrel, there's a, there's a question here which is connected in a lot of these discussions that uh, and emails myself and, and, and Scott get. And uh, if you want to, if you actually got any questions at all, Scott, the best place for people to, to send them is, is to you, correct? Yeah, just info at rethinkinvesting.com.au. And um, I'll just read one out real quickly, Phil, because it's uh, a guy, Dan Barry, he messaged uh, almost on New Year's Eve, I can see. He basically mentioned... Um, uh, when you get your accountant on the podcast, I'd like to learn a little bit more about starting off in investing, whether setting up a trust, putting a property in joint names or a single name is best for tax reasons and future security of the portfolio with commercial property. And this is something I get asked a lot. And being a buyer's agent, you don't really want to be liable. Well, we're not allowed to answer these questions. So you naturally have to refer them to an accountant. So I'm fascinated to see what your generic response would be to this uh, this question. Uh, Man Manjul's got to say, people pay a lot of money for this advice. I'm not going to give it away for free. But anyway, we'll see if we can persuade him. No, no, we share and care. And share and care is what we do. Uh, uh, look, uh, the structure is the question that uh, Scott, I, we get that all the time, right? Which is structure do we buy? And and the first, first comment in terms of the structure side of it is that while there is no one answer, is that it's it's all to understand the positive and the negative of each structure, understand where my circumstances are, the individual investor's circumstances, and in terms of all of those positive and negative, where do I fall? So the structure are, is that you can buy it on your individual name, you can buy it on a joint name, right? So it could be tenancy in common or joint tenancy, 50-50, 90-10, either percentage in between the uh, their spouse and the partners, right? You can buy it on a partnership, you can buy it on a family trust, you can buy it on a unit trust, you can buy it on a corporate entity. You can also buy it on a self-managed separation fund as well. So all has positive and negative. Uh, individual naturally is easier, least uh, costly. Uh, and and uh, the trust and the structure means that there is a little bit more cost involved. But as it is, individual being easier and least costly means that you also don't have some of the benefits of the trust. And the benefit of the trust, two things. One is that you've got asset protection and you also have a tax planning. Tax planning in the sense that particularly while we speak about the trust, let's say discretionary trust, is that commercial property, when we're speaking 6.25%, 6.5%, uh, it's positive cash flow, right? So that cash needs to be distributed to one of the beneficiaries to pay the tax. And the benefit of a trust is that you can distribute it on your discretionary nature. And it's so wide, right? So it's a husband, wife kids, grandkids, parents, grandparents, brother, sister, nephew, niece. So that entire range that with the right level of election that you can distribute. So what that does is that that gives you quite significant level of tax benefit, even when you sell it, right? Is that the capital gain that you make, you can still distribute it that way. Now, a potential negative of a trust in residential property as it applies a lot more is that uh, the land tax is a bit more on the trust. So say New South Wales, as an example, there is no land tax threshold. Queensland, as an example, there is a nominal threshold, but, but sort of tax is higher, uh, same as Melbourne and same as everything else. But in commercial property, you don't have that challenge, right? Because if the land tax is being paid by the tenants, so to speak, that means uh, that negative is not negative. Now, the second negative of a trust in a residential property is that if there was a loss being made on the trust, the loss stays within the trust. You can't distribute the losses, right? Whereas in a commercial property, we're speaking about positive cash flow, right? So we distribute the loss. So trust is very common a structure that people do do it. There is a little bit of setup cost. There is a bit of a running cost. You make that as an informed decision. Um, do you really wish to do it on a corporate entity company? Don't get a 50% discount, CGT discount. So, uh, but company does have some benefits against it as well. So in some exceptional circumstances, one can do it in co corporate entity. You would only be doing uh, commercial property into a self-managed super fund in a very informed manner. 
and if it applies to your retirement, right? Because super fund is all about the retirement. You can't access that property. You can't rent yourself and all the rest of it, right? So in a very informed manner, it can. So trust is common. Corporate entities is reasonably common. Super fund is in an informed manner is, is, is quite acceptable. Individual, unless, unless there is a strong reason, one probably sort of question that whether it is on individual is is right. So now, how very, do you work? Sorry, uh, Scott. So, Mumsra, how do you work out then with a client which one to choose? Like, how would yeah, you go through that process? Good, 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 Mike. So we sit down with a client and we sort of say, okay, so if you buy it on individual basis, right? These are the positive and these are the negative. What's the positive? It's simple. There is no establishment cost. But on the other side, the negative is that uh, there's no tax benefit and all the rest of it, right? Trust has got this. So we go through on each structure and we give them the positive and the negative. We also give them the cost saying that, okay, so if you set up a trust with a trustee company, that's your establishment cost and that's your running cost. So we as an accountant, our role rather than sort of making that decision is more of making the client as informed as we can. And we sort of say that, okay, you, as, as John John, that example is that as the client, so now you know all the positive and negative, and you know all the level of the cost involved, what suits you the best? So let's say if cost, the initial setup cost is very, very important to us, then we probably should not be setting up the trust. We should be doing it on individual because there's no setup cost, right? And if we sort of say that, well, you know, a few grand sort of set up, setting up the structure as a one-off, which is tax deductible, perhaps not a big issue, and asset protection, tax flexibility is important to me, and, and even the succession planning, if I may, those things are important, then one goes into the trust. So we give the positive and the negative, and we let the client to make an informed decision. So a question I get asked a lot, Munn's rule is, uh, especially when buying larger commercial properties in the same state, is there a benefit of setting up a different trust for each purchase? Like, does it have any impact on land tax having one structure, one uh, unit trust first multiple if you're in the same state? Yeah, good question again, right? So uh, it, it, uh, the the answer in terms of the land tax side of it, it's sort of, I mean, land tax is each state is slightly different, right? So the answer will have all different answer depending on which state that you're investing. But generally speaking is that it sort of doesn't make any difference at all, particularly if the land tax is being paid by the tenants, right? So in that case, it's sort of, it doesn't make any difference. And in New South Wales, as an example, there is no land tax threshold, right? So whether you buy one or two or four properties into one trustee, paying land tax from dollar one day one right so it not so much the land tax side of it where it comes in that whether we want to do it in one trust uh, of multiple property or whether we want to set up different trust it all comes in in terms of your risk profile and the risk profile is what we say is that it's about having an asset into a sort of a bucket right it's that old analogy that you don't want to have all of your eggs in one basket right and you don't want to right all of your eggs in one bucket as such but at the same time, each setup of a trust has got a establishment cost as well as the running cost. So you almost need to sort of weigh it up saying that, okay, so if I set up, say, seven different trusts for seven different commercial property, what's my establishment cost and running cost? And does it really make sense? Or, or you know, uh, whether we sort of just do one or two as such where there is no one rule of thumb at all is that what I encourage to the client is that read the number of commercial property, perhaps look into more in terms of the asset value, right? So you could have a commercial property of four mil for argument's sake, 10 mil, or you could have five or six commercial property, each being only about a million dollar as such, right? And sort of almost sort of in your mind is to say how much asset that I want to hold into one trust. No one rule of thumb in my case is that I'm sort of comfortable about five to $7 million for each trust. Now there is not a whole lot of science behind it, right? To me is that that's sort of a one bit of a trust with a bit of an asset, then we look into a different trust. So Mansrul, there's thousands of tax related questions and I think Scott, we're gonna to have to get Mansrul back on and please keep those questions coming, uh, info at rethinkinvesting.com.au. But Mansrul, the, um, you, you do a lot of people's tax returns uh, as as property investors, resi or, or commercial. What's what's easier, mate? <laughs> the 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 commercial property is actually not bad at all because because you just got a plain simple rent, right? So you got a rent and and you've got the agents commission. 
and and you've got your interest right so you sort of get that the residential property is that you got to sort of look through with a whole lot of things so you've got council rate water rate insurance and all the rest of it right at the end whether it is both the same i suppose where from our experience uh feel that uh, if i just give one example where one got to be careful is that some of the deductibility attached to it and and how do we claim some of those deductibility the substantiation the question of the ATO uh, potential review and so so scott as an example let's say one of your client who's sort of saying that all right i'm buying this say two million dollar commercial property with uh let's just say 75 percent lvo for argument's sake right so i'm sort of paying 25 percent as sort of the uh, as personal deposit and i'm sort of also paying the incidental cost um outside it so it's a 75 percent as the lvr so the question on that example we go back to the client and we sort of ask is to say where where is the other 25 percent coming from is it a pure sort of a cash saving as an example then then of course there is no deductibility attached to it but very often what the client do as scott was saying previously is that they use the equity of some of the other property draw down that bit of the fund use that bit of the fund to purchase that commercial property right so if someone were to use take away 25% from an existing residential property, use that as a deposit to buy that commercial property with a new loan of 75% on that example, arguably we should be able to claim the entire 100% as a deduction, if not potentially 105%, which includes some of the incidental cost, provided that um, uh, the all the substantiation is there. So is one a little bit easier than others? Both has a couple of things, but with the right accountant, accountant needs to be inquisitive to make sure that we don't just take it on the face value. We just go a little bit deeper in terms of some of the numbers to understand the story completely. I'm, I'm, I'm happy you answered the question that way, Mandrill, because what you've highlighted is um, the, the need of good tax advice. Um, and just sitting there thinking, oh, I've got, on that example, 250 grand in cash sitting around. Um, oh, that's what that that's will be my contribution to the deposit. But what you're saying is that if you refinance another debt, so if you if you provide that deposit on the basis of it being leveraged rather than unencumbered, there is a better tax outcome for that. A lot of people just wouldn't think about that. Yeah, and 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 you know, I mean, we use the offset account as an example quite a bit. So mm -hmm. even if you have the cash, I mean, cash has got a value, right? And and cash is that old saying of cash is king, and particularly with the high level of the interest rate where we are at the moment, cash is a king. So wherever possible, that I would prefer not to use the cash. I mean, of course, there is some exception, right? Someone who's sort of a lot closer to the retirement, as an example, a gentleman, let's say, is 58 years old, he may wishes to use a lot more cash because he wants to reduce his risk. But generally speaking, is that I always sort of say is that, well, leave the cash into an offset account, because while you're leaving that into an offset account, you're already saving the interest. And if you're not comfortable with your level of the debts, all you do is that you transfer that from the offset account back to the other account, pay off the loan, right? But if you use that cash, is that while you've taken that new level of leverage, is that can you go back in retrospective and sort of say to the bank, well, we just want another 250 odd grand, right? Uh, so, so one needs to go a little bit deeper and one needs to sort of understand a bit more and also more sort of a strategic perspective. Yeah, yeah it's... um. And and you know, for a lot of people, that's that's probably doing the opposite of what they think they should be doing. If you've got cash, use the cash. But what you're saying, sometimes you're better off, depending where you are in your investment journey and 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 what your portfolio looks like. You're better off if you if you do have serviceability or fatten your serviceability, take the debt while you can. Um, but for a lot of people, they'd be concerned about the interest rate environment sort of going up, down, left, and right. Um, what would you, from an accounting point of view and a taxation point of view and st financial strategic point of view, Mandrill? How would you, how, what sort of recommendation or advice would you be giving commercial property investors around the rate environment? Um, how should they be approaching the next sort of three to five years um, in terms of continuity of their ability to make repayments and continuity of serviceability? Uh, to Scott's point earlier, the banks don't like calling in debt. Something dire needs to happen. So if you can take on debt, um, the bank's probably not going to knock on the door and say, can I have it back? So what do you do as a commercial property investor for the next sort of three to five years? Um, around rates is it going to stay about where they are right now, do you think? <laughs> oh, but if you were to ask the RBA, even RBA got this wrong, right? <laughs> so how do, 
tell you, I make a prediction for future, right? So it's it's such a butterfly effect, right? And and sort of it's so much sort of changes. But one sort of argues that whether we're getting very close to the top of the interest rate, right? Very close to the top of the interest rate. So uh, it, it, as I was speaking yesterday, and and Scott, you and I, we were speaking yesterday, and we were sort of saying that in one year time, we would not be surprised if the interest rate is a little bit lower than where it is today whether it sort of goes up a little bit and that sort of it sort of comes down and one year time we'll, we would not be surprised. But at the same time, there are so many macro sort of the impact which has a bearing, right? Uh, the last thing we need is another war somewhere and then everything else sort of changes, right? So all of those in there, but generally speaking is that the commercial property interest rate side of it is that overall, whether it's residential, whether it's commercial, whether sort of February, March, perhaps June is that we will see the peak and whether it sort of drops a bit more in there. I suppose the comment which I want to say, Phil, if I may, is that we spoke about the list dog, we spoke about a few things. Uh, very important is, is, is this concept of buffer, right? It's, it's just that little bit of that risk management. So whenever I personally say go into a certain level of debt is that I always sort of say that, well, I got to have some level of uh, liquid, uh, whether it's cash or shares, managed funds, either way, some level of liquid asset that has a sense of buffer. Now, we had that old saying, and old saying was that if you had about three months or of your serviceability as a buffer, then as, as a rule of thumb, you're probably reasonably okay, right? Uh, with sort of a little bit of a higher level of the interest rate, and so is that I'm sort of been a lot more comfortable anywhere between four to six months of sort of the buffer in our hand. It's a bit of a fine balance, right? And there is no one answer to it because see more buffer that you have means that yes, you, you're getting more and more and more safer, but is it also coming in as a cost? And the cost of that opportunity cost of giving away that opportunity cost, right? Because all those buffers means that you are not utilizing it. So it's a right level of balance, but either way, the buffer to me is very important anywhere between three to six months. That, that buffer has utility, right? Because it is, should be sitting an offset, reducing your interest rate. That's so, right. Exactly. So that's, that's that's a good thing, right? So, Scott, look, we've already been at this nearly an hour, mate. Um, you you, you get hundreds of questions uh, uh, regularly from from uh, clients around um, you know, taxation compliance, and hence the reason I'm going to leave the last question up to you, mate. What's uh, outside of those big questions we've asked now? What will be one of the most common queries you get around accountants and tax when it comes to commercial property? So the other biggest one I get is around depreciation. So depreciation, I, I believe, is one of the biggest differences between residential and commercial. There's been a rule change a few years ago, which meant you couldn't claim as much uh, through residential. So this actually has a very big impact on your post-tax yield. And not to mention that a lot of the value of a commercial property is the building itself because it might have a higher site coverage. They might have very high roofs, very high cost fit out. So your buildings can be worth millions of dollars, a lot more than land, the land itself in many cases as well. So from a post-tax return, this, um, this has a really big impact on your cash flow you get back from the, your return. So this question from Dean uh, a month ago is exactly along these lines. He said, hi guys, just wanted to confirm how depreciation is treated in regards to net yields, especially when they're purchasing in a trust. And what are the differences with residential if this situation was similar? So very common question on depreciation. Yeah. So Scott, the depreciation is a tax benefit, right? And and it's it's a deduction, but it's a paper deduction, as we call, as opposed to a physical deduction in the sense that we don't need to sort of pay it because we've already paid it as part of that building and sort of the everything that we sort of bought. And, and we can claim that as a as depreciation. As you say, that uh, 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 what we used to be able to claim is that plants and equipments as well as the building. We used to be able to claim both of, of the old as well as the new property where the changes came in is that the uh, the uh, existing properties or, or secondhand properties, so to speak, is that plants and equipments, perhaps we can't claim it, but we can still claim the building depreciation and any subsequent renovation that being done, arguably all of those can be claimed. Now, depreciation adds to your net uh, yield, so to speak. So if I just give a, a, a one example, if I may, is that uh, round figures, right? So let's just say that if there is a purchase for a million dollar property 
already being purchased, right? And let's again use a RAM figure saying that, well, you're getting a 6% return, uh, net return, right? So you've got a 6% net return on that property. Let's assume that your depreciation on that property is about 15,000. Let's assume, right? So if you've got a 15,000 depreciation and let's assume that it's sitting on a trust as, as the gentleman sort of suggested, and from a trust, the profit will be distributed to uh, either an individual, to a corporate entity somewhere else. And the tax benefit will depend on the marginal tax rate of that ultimate beneficiaries, right? So if someone is sort of sitting at the highest marginal rate, is that that $15,000 depreciation, you would get the tax benefit all the way to about 47% plus the Medicare. So you get close to 50%, 49, right? But if it sort of goes into a corporate entity, you may get anywhere between 25 to 30%. Uh, an individual, if the income is a little bit lower, it may not be 47, it may be lower. So let's use a figure of 30%. Let's say we get a 30% tax benefit, right? It depends on where it is, how it is. So on that example is that if there is a 15,000 depreciation, 30% of that 15,000 is, is about uh, 4,500, right? And then if I use 4,500 on the original purchase price, on, on that example of a million dollar, I get a 0.45% return. So all of a sudden, your 6%, which is the net yield after the tax benefit, it's sort of gone up to 6.45%, right? So, well, that helps. And on that example, that helps, right? It's actually even better. Why is it even better that, say, your 6% net yield is a pre-tax benefit, right? Mm -hmm. There is a tax obligation to it. Whereas the depreciation that I've given on that example of 0.45%, which is adding to your net yield, is that it's the tax benefit. So one argues that it's actually even more. But we set aside that 0.45%, it does help. And what I've seen, Scott, is that commercial property raised it, right? Particularly with some of the larger commercial property, you get very hefty depreciation. In my example, that where I assume that 15 grand uh, out of a million dollars is that I, I probably would argue that it's probably relatively conservative, right? And you get some hefty sort of a depreciation. So your 0.45% quite easily sort of increase much higher. And if you can add away another percent on top of your existing net yield, well, that makes a world of difference. So your main message is definitely get a depreciation report. For commercial absolutely might and and you know i hear that all the time sometimes i hear the question about the cost and everything else and i said guys the depreciation is a one-off cost that you're sort of getting a good quantity surveyor to do it and very often what they do they give you that report that you can use for 20 years or the entire lifespan of the property and whatever that one-off cost that you're paying which is nominal is that that's also tax deductible but set that aside you've got the depreciation for that entire time right there's no additional sort of a payment so wholeheartedly cannot could not possibly more agree that how depreciation is quite fundamental and Mansoor, you don't do the depreciation report you, you no no my we as an accountant we're not allowed to do the depreciation and we can't do that uh so it's the registered quantity surveys group uh, they're the one who do the depreciation. If a client makes an actual uh, renovation on their own, and they've got all the receipts, the time and the invoices and all the rest of it, then we can use those, but we are not allowed to make an estimate, Scott. Yeah, and it's fascinating you mentioned the post-tax return because I've seen some, uh, especially newer build ones where like it might be a drive-through investment or a very high-roofed industrial property. The depreciation can be hundreds of thousands a year for yeah. say a, a five million dollar property you know like there's there's a huge amount of post-tax return uh, benefit there and it means you in some cases many cases in fact that you pay zero tax on your entire net income after the mortgage cost so it's almost like a tax-free income if your depreciation benefit almost matches your post-tax uh you know income that comes through so it's a very tax efficient uh, strategy, commercial property. And it's just one of the, the other benefits that many people might forget as they go through it. And, and see, on the trust, right, on the gentleman who sort of asked that question about the trust part of it is that the, the profit on the trust that you distribute from the trust to the uh, beneficiaries. So you've got this concept called accounting profit. And you've got this concept of taxable profit, right? So it's really the taxable profit is the one that you distribute and someone pays tax. But the accounting profit 
instead of the actual really cash profit. So on that example, when you sort of say $5 million property and let's say hundreds of thousands of dollars of depreciation as such, right? So all of those, the gap between the accounting profit and the taxable profit, which is really your tax benefit, is the extra cash, which is distributed as tax-free as such. No, perfect. Uh, well, I think we've lost Phil, but uh, I think we're all, all about done, I think. Phil's so, back. Can you, see, can you oh, guys Phil. hear me? Mike. Yeah. yeah oh, I'm back, well, I'm I'm back you engaged, do your wrap up, but <laughs> Well, I got it's, it's not very stable internet where I am, but um, uh, you know, over in New Zealand, but they've only just found the internet here. So uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll give them that benefit of the doubt. But uh, Mandra, look, you know, we, we've got really sort of, uh, we started off with discussions quite philosophical and strategic, and then got down into the, the tactical, some of the tactical components of um, taxation accounting when it comes to commercial property. And it's just a sage reminder that um, uh, if you are a commercial investor, you need to have a, a very good account that can maximize uh, not only the assets you're buying, but help you realize um, um, what you can achieve in, in commercial property. So thanks for your time today, Munzer. We'll have to get you back in. Uh, those you. questions, get them through to info at rethinkinvesting.com. We'll get Munzer in. Ask him anything when it comes to tax. And if you feel as though if you might need some more help, just give him a call. Munzer, how can people find you? What, what's your website? Uh, the KHI partners.com.au and the landline 02 Thank you. We got it there. And uh, Scott, mate, um, uh, remiss of us not to bring an accounting sooner. So uh, let's do more of it. Um, some of these technical practitioners are uh, absolutely key. So uh, thanks for your time today, mate. No worries at all. And uh, best wishes to 2023 to both of you. And yeah, and uh, as always, if you guys have any questions, please uh, put them through. Suggestions for future guests, would love them. And uh, yeah, if you uh, get any value out of this, we'd love you to leave uh, a five-star review for our podcast. It would be uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. That's uh, Rethink Investing with uh, Inside Commercial Property, Rethink Investing uh, on Phil Tarrant, co-host, along with Scott O'Neill. We'll see you again next time. Until then, bye-bye.